All right, guys, I'm going to answer a few quick questions here real fast. So let's see. I have uh, first question here is f of x, oh, f of x equals 9 over 2x to the ninth. And the answer is to find f prime. There's actually two you know, general ways to go about doing that here. The first would be to differentiate as is. That is, just go ahead and use the quotient rule because we have a quotient of two functions right here. The other way would be to rewrite this as 9 over 2 times x to the negative ninth. In that way, we could use the power rule that we talked about last week. So either you could use the quotient rule with this version of f or the power rule with this version of f. Let's do it both ways and see how we get the same answer. So let's do the quotient rule first. Quotient rule says that f prime of x will be equal to the quotient of several things. So it's the derivative of the top. So the derivative of 9 times the bottom function, 2x to the ninth, minus the derivative of the bottom function, 2x to the ninth times the top function, which is 9, over the bottom function squared. Okay. Let's see here. What's the derivative of 9? Well, the derivative of 9 is 0. So you're going to have 0 times 2x to the ninth minus What's the derivative of 2x to the ninth? So that's a power rule situation. We would take the derivative of x to the ninth, get, uh, get 9x, excuse me, you get 9x to the eighth, but then 9 times 2 gives you 18. So 18x to the eighth times 9. Okay. And then the bottom, let's go ahead and uh, use the rules of exponents to simplify that. So we have 2 squared times x to the ninth squared. That is 4 times okay, x, x to the ninth squared is x to the 18th power. Okay, so doing a little bit of simplifying here. That's 0, because 0 times that function is 0. So we're left with negative uh, 18 times 9 negative 18 times 9, so that is going to be, let's see, negative 162, I believe it is, x to the 8th over 4x to the 18th. Now it looks like we can reduce that a little bit. Uh, those are both divisible, divisible by 2 at least, so that would be negative 81 and a 2. Now we have x to the 8th on the top, x to the 18th on the bottom. So rules of exponents would say that reduces to x to the 10th on the denominator. So there we go. Uh, 81 is not divisible by 2. So we're left with negative 81 over 2x to the 10th. Now, let's show how you get the exact same solution if instead you don't treat it as a quotient rule, but you treat the function as just a coefficient times uh, a power function. Okay, So we'd use the power rule at that point, in which case we would say f prime of x is equal to, all right, so with the power rule we would, we would want to factor out that 9 has, which we could have technically done in the previous, uh, the previous uh, quotient rule, but we, uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of ways to, to do these. Okay, but we're going to factor out that 9 halves and then take the derivative of x to the negative 9 power. So we have the constant multiple rule that says we have, a, we have a coefficient out front. We can factor it out and then take the derivative of the variable part. Now we have that 9 halves just coming along for the ride. But what's the derivative of x to the 9th? Well, we bring out the negative 9 and then write x to the negative 9 
minus one power. So be careful with the, your negative signs here. We reduce the original exponent by one, but when it's already negative, the result's going to be a bigger negative number. So that's negative nine times x to the negative ten. So now there's our well, we, we have our derivative. Let's just do the, re, the reducing part. So we have negative 9 times 9 on the numerator. That gives us negative 81. There's a 2 on the denominator. But that x to the negative 10, you know, we don't want to leave our solutions final with negative exponents. And that negative 10 power will kick it to the bottom and make the power positive. So notice, exact same answer here and here. Two different methods, you get the exact same answer. And that's going to be the case with lots of these derivatives. There's going to be different options. As long as you're following the derivative rules and the rules of algebra to simplify uh, and, and to transform your function, you'll be fine. Okay? But you're only ever rewriting. So here we, we took the function as given, rewrote it using the rules of exponents, and that gave us another way to solve. I would say this way was easier if you ask me. But not that that way was hard, but there was a little more involved there. Again, multiple ways to do these. Now, the next question was about finding a second derivative. So the next function was f of x equals x times cosine of x. And we were tasked with finding the second derivative. Well, to find the second derivative, we got to find the first derivative. So let's differentiate this one time and see what it looks like. So f prime of x. Now what kind of situation do we have here? That's a product of two functions. We have the function x and we have the function cosine x. So we have the product of two functions. So we need to use the product rule. The product rule says you take the derivative of your first function, which is x, and multiply it by your second function, cosine x. Then you add it to the derivative of your second function, which is cosine x, and multiply it, that by your first function, x. Okay? So let's see here. What is the derivative of x? Well, that's just 1. So we'll have 1 times cosine. So cosine x, what's the derivative of cosine? It's a negative sine. So we'll have negative sine x times x. I'll write that as x sine x, like so. Because, you know, that x can't magically appear inside the argument all of a sudden. It's, it's x times sine x. Okay, so I'm going to put that out there just to, just to be careful, just so we're clear. Okay, so there is my first derivative. There is f prime. Now, if I want f double prime, I just take this and differentiate it. So, f double prime of x is equal to, what's the derivative of cosine? Well, we just talked about that. It's negative sine. Okay, now, to take this derivative, that's a product again. We have x. We have sine x, so we have to use the product rule. Now, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put that negative sign there and do my product rule in parentheses so I don't have to keep dealing with the negative sign you know, for, for the product rule's sake. I'm going to leave the negative sign out front. Now, the product rule says we take the derivative of the first function, which is x, multiply by the second function, and then add the product of the derivative of the second function, which is sine x, times the first function, x. Okay? So now we're just to the halfway through this derivative process. So negative sine x minus the derivative of x is just 1. So minus sine x plus what's the derivative of sine? Well, it's cosine. So that's cosine of x times x. Again, I'm going to write the x in front like so. Okay? So that is the derivative 
Now we just need to do a tad bit of simplifying. So this is negative sine x, distributing our negative sign, negative sine x minus x cosine x. And I think here we have two negative sine x's. So that combined like terms. And then we just have minus x cosine x. And there you are. There is f double prime of x. Okay? Negative 2 sine x minus x cosine x. Alright, the third question I had to talk about right now is one of these graphical questions where we're finding the derivative graphically. So we have a picture here. Now, the reason we can do this graphically is that these are all linear line segments. Now, clearly this is a piece, these are piecewise defined functions. We don't, we're not given the actual rule for the functions, but we're given a graph here. And the thing you have to remember is that if you're dealing with a linear function, the graph of the tangent line to a linear function is going to be the graph, uh, is going to be the graph of the line. So the slope of the tangent line, which is the derivative at a point, slope of the tangent line at a point, that's what we have, that's what the derivative is, that's going to just be equal to the slope of the linear, uh, of the linear equation at that point. So for instance, the slope of the tangent line of g at 4 is equal to the slope of this line segment at 4. And we know the slope of that line segment is 0, because it's horizontal. Okay. Likewise, the slope of f at 4 would be the slope of this line. And if we just consider the rise of a run, it looks like that slope is negative 1 if you look at just counting uh, rise over run. Okay. Pick a point on the graph, and how do you get a point, another point on the graph? You go down 1 and to the right 1, so negative 1 over positive 1. And so you get their slope is a negative 1. Now, here we have uh, h and s defined as the composition of f with g and then g with f respectively. Now we have to use the chain rule here. This exercise here is to get you to really focus on what the chain rule actually means. Okay, so the chain rule says if I want to uh, take the derivative of f evaluated at g of x, that is f composed with g of x, here is what uh, Here's what the chain rule says for h prime. So I'll write it up here. h prime of x, the chain rule says, take the derivative of your outside function, evaluate it at your inside function. So f prime is the outside function we, that we took the derivative of. Uh, and then we evaluate it at our inside function, g. But then we have to multiply by the derivative of our inside function. So that's what the chain rule says h prime is going to be. Now likewise, if we had the composition going the other way, g composed with f, the chain rule says here that s prime of x is going to be equal to the derivative of the outside function, which is g in this case, evaluated at our inside function, times the derivative of our inside function, which was f. So that's what the chain rule says we're going to have to use to find these two derivatives, h prime and s prime. Now, we're dealing with at a specific point here. So let's see what happens at those specific points. Specifically, if we accept use negative 1 here instead of x, this is going to be f prime at g of 1, oops, sorry, that's a negative 1, times g prime of negative 1. Now, we can find all of these things. Okay, let's look at our graph. What is g of negative 1? That's, that's asking for just evaluate the function g at an x value of negative 1. That's just algebra class. So here's g at negative 1. So there is negative 1. What is the y value on g? Well, here's g. The y value is 5. Okay? So g of negative 1 is 5. So we can simplify this as f' 
prime of 5 times g prime of negative 1. Now, how do we find these two things? That asks for the slope of f at 5. This asks for the slope of g at negative 1. So we need to find the slope of the tangent lines. And since these are linear equations, linear line segments, it's going to be equal to the slope of the line at those two points. So here's, where's, where's 5? So 5 is right there. What is the slope of f at 5? Oh, we just talked about that. That's negative 1. Okay, again, I'm just looking at the lines of it here. To, get, to start at this point, to get to a, this point, I go down 1 over 1. So the slope is negative 1 there. So f prime at 5 is negative 1. Let's do the same thing for g of negative 1. So this is asking for the slope of the tangent line of g at negative 1. So negative 1 is right here. And what's the slope of g? Uh, well, g is, is this one right here. So what is the slope of that? Well, it's, if you, just, you use your rise over run definition, if you start here and you count down, so that's a rise of negative 1 and over 2, so a run of positive 2, it looks like our slope is negative 1 half. So negative 1 half, and if we just multiply those, we get positive 1 half. Okay? So we used the definition of the chain rule and got ourselves the final answer there. Again, this is testing your ability to use the chain rule. And of course, also your ability, the, your knowledge of what it means to be a derivative, specifically when you have a linear equation. Let's do the same thing for s prime of 1. s prime of 1, going back to our uh, chain rule definition, that's g prime evaluated at f of 1 times f prime of 1. Now, what's f of 1, that part there in the middle? That's not, that's not calculus. That's just asking for the y value associated with, with 1 on the f function. So here's 1. What's the y value of f? Well, it looks like... 6. Okay, so f of 1 is 6. So we can just substitute in there. We want g prime of 6 times f prime of 1. Okay, so what's f prime of 1? Let's do that first. f prime of 1, that's asking for the slope of the tangent line of f when x equals 1. So here's x equals 1. What's the slope of the f function? which is this one right here, what's the slope of that line above 1? Well, if you just look at rise over 1 using the graph, it looks like the slope is equal to 1, because if you start here and go up and over 1 each, rise over 1 is 1 over 1. So that part is 1. Now what is this part? So f prime of 1 is 1, because that's the slope of the tangent line of f at 1, what's the slope of the tangent line of g at 6? So here's 6 right here. What's the slope at this point right here? Now let's be careful here. That is at a weird point. Okay. If you look right at that point that I just, that I just bolded, okay, that's right at a point where the slope is changing. If you consider all of the slope of this line right here, so to the left of that point, all of that slope is a zero because it's a horizontal line. If you look to the right of this point, that slope right there is negative one. Uh, actually, sorry, I lied, is negative one half. Okay, rise over one being negative one over positive two, so negative one half. So the slope to the right of 6 is negative 1 half. The slope to the left of 6 is 0. So since those two slopes do not match up at this point, and at that point is where the, the slope changes, that derivative does not exist. Okay? This is this right here, g prime of 6, 
does not exist. Okay, so does not exist, we can't continue. Because if this doesn't exist, then one times it doesn't make any sense. So the answer here, does not exist. Now typically, we say that the, 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 the more typical situation is, is that the derivative does not exist like at a sharp turn or a cusp. Now that's, a, that's what we would call a sharp turn right there. So the derivative, okay, that's at 7 right there. The derivative of f at 7 would not exist. Likewise, the derivative of f at 3 would not exist. But it doesn't have to be a sharp turn necessarily if you have like a piecewise defined function like this. This is a special case. This is piecewise defined even though you don't see the piecewise definition anywhere. So even though that's not a really sharp turn, since this is not a smooth curve, it's essentially two line segments put together in a piecewise definition, those two slopes do not match up. Again, if this was a nice smooth curve, this wouldn't be an issue. But since, it's, since, since this is a distinct line segment, and then a distinct another line segment with two different slopes, at the point 6, uh, g is not differentiable. g is not differentiable at 6. g is also not differentiable at 3. Right here, same thing happens. Not differentiable there either. Because to the right, there's a slope of 0. But to the left, there's a slope of uh, negative one half again. So since uh, this is a special case because we have a piecewise, piecewise definition here. So again, not differentiable here, here on G, or here, or here on F. So this composition here does not exist because one of the pieces necessary does not exist. So this composition is not differentiable at 1. S is not differentiable at 1. It is continuous, so that's, that's a good example of continuity not implying differentiability. Because both of these functions are indeed continuous, but both of them have a, uh, excuse me, a, a non-differentiable point there, non-differentiable point there, right there, and right there. So there's four points, two on each of these functions that are not differentiable but they're both continuous functions. So we have used our chain rule, applied the chain rule here and here, and then applied that to negative one and positive one respectively, filled out the pieces we need by using the graph. The first one we got the answer, that was nice, one half. Second one, we could not get a good solution or a solution, or, uh, we got a solution, just not, just not a good one uh, because this right here, g prime, the derivative of g at 6 does not exist. So, if you have more questions, feel free to let me know. I do like these questions, so it's important that you do uh, understand what we just did here. Because if you've noticed, I have assigned something like this on pretty much every homework assignment. Whether it's a graph and you're finding the you know, composition derivatives, or maybe it's a graph and you're finding derivatives via a product rule or a chain rule, uh, excuse me, a product rule or quotient rule, or maybe you're finding derivatives off of a graph like this and you're using the sum and difference rule or the constant multiple rule. So I like these graphs. They really test your knowledge of derivatives, what a derivative is, and your ability to use the properties of derivatives. So if you have any help, if you need any help, just let me know because you will see these more in the future. All right, see you soon. Have a good weekend.